Well, good morning. good morning. I'm a little loud today. I was playing with the sound and messed it all up on Matthias last night. So he'll adjust it in just a minute, but hopefully it's not too loud for you to kind of deal with as we move forward. Hey, I wanted to share with you that, you know, God has been really good to me this week. Uh, I don't know if you ever have these weeks, but sometimes I get myself a little more busy than I should. Um, and then things come up and you try to figure out how are we going to get all these things in place and how is it going to like get from A to B and C and D and, and E and E and E and F and all those things. And yet, you know, the Lord is so good that he had plans. And each time it seemed like I was coming up against a struggle, I just said, Lord, whatever you want to do, you do. And he just worked it all out. And so I, I share that today as a kind of a testimony to say that we serve a living God a God who is active, a God who is loving us, a God who's working these things out, even when maybe we should say yes and we're saying no or, or no and yes, God has a plan to use us in his way. And so I just want to give him all the praise for that today. I hope you're praising him today as well. We have a great service in store for you today, but let's just begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, how grateful we are that you are God. How grateful for your love, how grateful for your compassion and your grace and your mercy and all these things that you are. Fathers, we've gathered together today. We just want to be able to worship you. If there's things in our lives that, are, that might withhold that, help us right now to just lay those things at your feet. Father, we just trust you uh, for this time to come. You allow us simply to focus on you as we sing songs, as we pray, as we hear the message you provided. May you bless us through it, and may we be drawn ever closer to you and to each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. Would you stand with me, please, and sing... All people that on earth do dwell, a great old hymn of the church. All 
All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice, serve him with joy, his praise foretell. Come ye before him and rejoice. The Lord ye know is God indeed. Without our aid he did us make. We are his flock he doth us feed. And for his sheep he doth us take. The fourth verse, number four, please. For why the Lord our God is good, his mercy is forever sure, his truth at all times firmly stood, and shall from age to age endure. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Praise all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly and Holy Ghost. Well, praise the Lord. You may be seated. The words on the screen are a little different than the ones in your songbook, if you've been following, but nevertheless, we got through it, the old 100th, and uh, it's a great old hymn of the church. Last Sunday, we rejoiced that Jesus has risen from the dead, and before he left this earth, he said, I'm coming back. And Jesus is coming again. Let's sing that song together today. <clears throat> Marvelous message we bring, glorious carol we sing, wonderful words of the King. Jesus is coming again, coming again, coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon. Coming again, coming again. Oh, what a wonderful day that will be. Jesus is coming again. Forest and flowers of time, mountain and meadow the same. All earth and heaven proclaim, Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon. Coming again, coming again. Oh, what a wonderful day it will be. Jesus is coming again. Standing before him at last, trials and troubles all pass. Gentle his feet we will cast. Jesus is coming again. Coming again. Coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, but maybe soon. 
coming again, coming again. Oh, what a wonderful day it will be. Jesus is coming again. Amen. In just a moment, our ushers will come and receive our tithes and offerings. Want to just share a few announcements with you before we move forward today. Uh, first, we want to say thank you to the Building and Grounds Committee. Uh, they met yesterday for a few minutes, and if you weren't able to come yesterday and you want to be part of the committee, you haven't missed out. Uh, we will certainly get that information to you for the next meeting. Uh, but they also did some work outside at the same time, and so I want to thank uh, both Fred and my dad, who, who worked hard yesterday to do some things around the church. So things are starting to come now that spring is here, and we got lots to do in order to truly beautify this, this home of God, this place of worship that we come to. I um, want to let you know that our district assembly starts tonight. Be praying for those who are going and representing us. Uh, we'll be there through Tuesday and just enjoying time with, the fellow, with our fellow Nazarenes on our district. And so that's tonight through Tuesday. Uh, tomorrow is our community outreach lunch from 12 to 1230. Uh, Tuesday's adult Bible study has been canceled for this week because part of the, the attendees there will be out of town. Um, and then, of course, our CA groups are still meeting throughout the week as, as planned. Next Sunday is the 1st of May, and so it's a very important today because it's Potluck Sunday. Well, not exactly. It's, it's important. We want you to come next week and enjoy Potluck Sunday, but it's also important in the Church of the Nazarene because we're starting what's called a half-million mobilization. Uh, the idea in the church, at least for our North America, Canada region, is we're asking all the people to be praying uh, from May 1st until Pentecost about what God might do uh, in our districts and in our churches and our lives uh, for that time period. And so if you didn't get a bowl today, make sure you get one. It has a website address that you can download the prayer journal. Uh, we tried to get those for you, and unfortunately they sold out faster than we could order them, uh, but you can download it. Also, if you have a smartphone, uh, you're welcome to, to pull that out. And in the bulletin is a, uh, well, it just tells you that you can search for Half Million Mobilization app, either at your Apple Store or Google Play Store. You probably know more about the, that than I do. But it will download the app to your phone. And then I think you get a daily reminder of, of who to pray for or, or how that might work. But make sure you get a bulletin today. If you need to have more questions, let me know before next week, and we'll get you set up on that. But I think it's going to be an exciting time or half a million Nazarenes are praying together every day to see what God, how God's hand might work upon the places we live. So also next week would be our board meeting, May 3rd, in the Fellowship Hall. So I think that's all the announcements. If our ushers will come forward, we'll receive our tithes and offerings. Again, gracious God, Heavenly Father, what a privilege to be in your house, but not just to be here, but participate in your work through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Father, you've blessed us so much in how you provide for us. Father, as we now give this small portion back to you, will you take it and use it not just in our church, but in churches across the country and around the world. May you use it to really bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, with that, we want to stand and greet one another. Last week, we said he is risen, and we would respond, he's risen indeed. Let's try that again today. At the same time, we'll dismiss our children to Children's Church. So let's stand and greet one another. He is risen. He is risen
I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, joined hands with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Let's sing that one more time as you find your place together. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joint heirs with Jesus as we travel is on. For I'm part of the family. The family of God. Thank you. You may be seated. Our responsive reading today is called The Suffering Servant. It's number 248 in your hymn notebook. Please read along with me on the screen if you can. Let's read this responsibly. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And like a root out of dry ground. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and familiar with pain. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. And carried out our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He the May the Lord add his blessing to this reading from his word. Through Calvary and Jesus uh, dying for us, he has covered our sins in his body on the tree. Let's sing that old gospel song, Covered by the Blood. Once my sin's darkest night, I was wandering alone, a stranger to mercy I stood. But the Savior came nigh when he heard my faint cry, and he put my sins under the blood. They are covered by the blood, covered by the blood. My sins are all covered by the blood. Mine iniquities so vast have been blotted out at last. My sins are all covered by the blood. From the burden I carry, now I am set free. Oh, Jesus has lifted my load. Oh, the love and the grace I received in his place. When he put sins under the blood, praise the Lord. They are covered by the blood, covered by the blood. My sins are all covered by the blood. My iniquities so vast have been blotted out as last. Sins are all covered by the blood. I can ne'er understand why he sought even me, why his life blood on Calvary flowed. But sufficient for me, since he died on the tree, he has put my sins under the blood. They are covered by the blood, covered by the blood, my sins, covered by the blood. Mine iniquity so vast, blotted out at last, my sins are all covered by the blood. Now he comes to my heart. 
He bears all my cumbering load. In the pathway replete with His love are my feet. Since He put my sins under the blood, they are covered by the blood. Covered by the blood. All covered by the blood. My iniquities so vast have been blotted out at last. Sins are all covered by the blood. The name that gets your attention is your own name. In a crowd, if somebody hollers, Tom, all the Toms look around. And in the scripture, Jesus is the sweetest name I know because he's just the same as his lovely name. Let's sing that chorus only for our prayer chorus today as pastor comes to lead us in prayer in just a moment. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same as his lovely name, and that's the reason why I love him so. Oh, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Once again, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And he's just the same as his lovely name. And that's the reason why I love him so. Oh, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Amen. As we go before the Lord this morning, many of you have heard that Janet Bates had a pretty big stroke this week and has since passed away. And so today we want to pray for her family, for, for Jody who attends here and her husband Neil and, and the rest of the family. Also, we've been praying for a long time for my Uncle Dean as his cancer has spread, but we were told this week that his cancer is basically fully engulfing his body um, and that his, his time is limited. So um, as of yesterday afternoon, they were almost talking like they were switching him to comfort care, but now they've decided they're going to go ahead and do some more things or try some more things, but we'd certainly just appreciate your prayers. Um, if you haven't heard about my Uncle Dean, we're just truly, truly wanting him to come to know the Lord before his time is up. And so just be praying more so for his healing uh, physically, but more so for the spiritual opening of his eyes to receive Jesus as a Savior uh, before that time comes. So uh, lots of other things on our list to pray for, but let's just go before the Lord. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, what a privilege to come before you in prayer. You are the God of heaven and earth, and as I testified earlier, you are at work in our lives each and every day. Father, you have blessed me this week and helped me in so many ways. And, and I know that you're here for each one of us. We believe that you are everywhere, that you're omnipresent. We think oftentimes it's just a matter of opening our eyes that we might see you, that we might recognize your presence, that we might rest and bask in your presence. Father, as we see the sun shining outside and it seems like it's been a wild winter, early spring time frame, we just praise you for the beauty of this day as we know that you have given it to us. You've given us the breath of life and, and all that we know, and we're just grateful and rejoicing in today for all that you're about to do. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for watching over us and walking beside us. Thank you that although life is sometimes hard and maybe we don't understand all that goes on, you are there. You are always there, and you're always faithful. We give you praise today because of your faithfulness and because of your grace and because of your omniscient power. We love you so much. Father, today as we come before you, we lift up these who are hurting. Father, we thank you today for Janet's life and how you have 
blessed it and used her and her family and in the church in other ways. Father, now as you have taken her home to be with you, we just pray for her family. We pray for our church family, Lord, as we will miss her. But Lord, we recognize that as Christians who know you, that there will come a day of rejoicing, of reuniting together in heaven. And so, Lord, thank you for taking her home, but thank you for the knowledge that one day we'll see her again. Lord, help us now to reach out and minister to her family and and, and to love on them through this time. And may this time just be a gentle reminder for them of how much you love us as well. Father, today we pray for my Uncle Dean, and, and even though this cancer has again spread, and we know that that's an ailment that too many people have to deal with in this world, Father, you know our prayers really go out for his soul. We know that there was a time, and I don't know for how long, but as a, as a young man, he attended this church or, or growing up. And Lord, I just pray that you would open the doors of his heart. That as you're calling upon him, that he would be open and that he would receive you as the Savior once again. Father, we pray for others in our lives that simply need Jesus. As we think of last week and our celebration of Easter and the resurrection, uh, Father, we just want that everybody would know about the resurrection. So many today are on a path of death and destruction and hell and, and don't even know it. Lord, our hearts want to be like yours, that we want all to know Jesus. Father, there's also today, as we look around, many that are missing Many that are dealing with different types of illnesses, some maybe cancer or other things, some maybe the common cold or flu or maybe even COVID, we're not sure. But Father, will you touch all those that are home today that couldn't be with us because of sickness? Father, give them strength and may your will be to heal them in such a way that they could join us again next week as part of our church family. Father, today we pray for our country for our president and those that surround him. We pray for our state and our governor and those that surround him and, and pray for local leaders, Lord. Father, we just believe that you have placed these men and women in these positions for your purpose. And so, Lord, would you bless them according to your will. Father, we pray for the pastors that represent the pulpits, that stand in the pulpits that represent you around this country and around the world today. May you bless each one and may the who are listening. We pray, Lord, that a mighty revival might come forth through the churches, through your churches, that people would come to know Jesus. Father, today we pray for those who serve and protect us, for our, our nation's military men and women. Father, would you bless them and keep them safe today. Bring those who are in foreign lands home soon, and may we know a time of peace. We pray also, Lord, for those who serve us here at home, for our police officers and firefighters and EMTs and those along the front lines of disease and death. Father, grant them your mercy and your help today. May today be a day where your lordship just basks in our lives. Father, today we also pray for the war in Ukraine, for the brothers and sisters in Christ, both in Ukraine and Russia, Lord, that you would protect them that you would watch over them and draw them near to you. Lord, that you would keep them safe and that this war would come to an end quickly, that peace may abound. But Father, we know the devil's at work all around us, all around this great big world that is always trying to cause more conflict and strife. Father, may we as your children bring about unity and peace and love everywhere we go. Father, today we pray for our community, for Everett and the communities we represent, Lord, that your light might shine through us, that wherever we go, whether it be to work or to play or whatever we do, Lord, that people would see Jesus, that we would become less and you would become more. Help us, Lord, to carry an attitude of love and hope, of grace and peace as we interact with people, especially people who need Jesus. Father, today we pray for our church family. We pray for those that are here sitting in the pews, Lord, and for those at home uh, watching through their device. We just pray, Lord, your blessings upon them. 
Father, you know each heart, you know each desire, you know each want, you know whatever's going on, and we simply lift them to you collectively because we trust you to do according to your plan. Father, touch each one, heal each one, bless each one as you see fit, and use each one to bring yourself glory. And Father, this morning we come before you humbly ourselves. Father, we know that you know us better than we know ourselves. That you know the desires of our hearts and the needs that we have. And, and we just trust you, O oh Lord, that you'll fulfill those again as you see fit. May your will be done in our life as it's done in the kingdom of heaven. May you be in charge of all that we do. May you grant us those things that you would grant us. And, and Lord, help us to represent you in all that we do. Father, for all these things, we'll be careful to give the honor and the glory and the praise. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'll turn in your Bibles today to John chapter 20. Last week, we read the first uh, 22 verses, I believe. Uh, today, we're going to read from verses 22, 24 through 29. And if you can, please stand for the read of God's word once you get there. Again, chapter, John chapter 20, beginning at verse 24. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in my hands, I'm sorry, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me, and yet have believed. Father God, as we break this bread of life this morning, speak to us anew and afresh about this idea of your presence, your meeting with us, and may it bring you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. What if I told you today that UFOs are real? In fact, what if I said that not only are they real, but, but I saw one myself the other day? What would you think? Probably that I have a screw loose, right? Maybe that I shouldn't be the pastor anymore if I really think that. But what if I kept insisting that I did see it? Would you believe me then? Maybe. But there's a good chance that you wouldn't believe me unless you could see it for yourself, right? Now, to be clear, I did not see a UFO. And I'm not in any way claiming that UFOs are real. So if you only take one thing away from today's sermon, please don't take that with you and start spreading that news. But in life, you know, there are lots of things that we have to see for ourselves in order to believe. And honestly, that's probably the way it should be. I don't know if you've seen it, but a few years ago, there was a commercial that had to do with the idea that it must be true because they saw it on the Internet. Might have been a State Farm commercial, something like that. But, but you know what I'm talking about. And at the end of the commercial, the guy, this gal says something to the effect that I'm dating this uh, French model. And this goofy looking guy walks up and says, bonjour. And we all know it's really not true. And the truth is, there's all kinds of things that we can see on our phones if we pull them out. Or, or see on our computers if we pull them out. Or if we're honest with ourselves, when we go to the grocery store and we see those kind of magazines right there at the checkout that, that want to give us the latest and greatest gossip about what's going on, we know that lots of those things may not be true, right? Lots of things for people, we have to kind of see it for ourselves to believe. I think our text today has to do with that same idea. Now, if you joined us last week on Easter Sunday, we did read from the passage from John 1 to 20. John, I'm sorry, John 20, 1 to 20. And it talked about the empty tomb and how uh, Jesus first appeared to Mary Magdalene and then his disciples. And we talked about the symbol of the Easter egg and how we might be able to use it 
to share the good news that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and that we can have eternal life. This week, we want to move further through that passage to explore the idea of what it really means to see for ourselves that Jesus is alive. You see, too often, I think that, and maybe it's when we grow up in the church or how it comes, that we just say it's a given. It should just be expected. Everybody should just believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And yet if we're honest with ourselves, if, if we think about it from the terms of other people who haven't maybe grown up in the church or haven't spent a lot of time in the church, it's not necessarily a given. It's not an expectation that just all will believe. For many people, they need to have a moment in time where they understand, where they come to their own conclusion that Jesus is alive. They need to see it for themselves. So what we've seen so far in John 20 is the disciples of Jesus needed different things to come to a full, mature belief in Jesus. Remember in in John chapter 20, verse 2 from last week, um, that one of the disciples loved Jesus, needed only the facts. He saw the empty tomb, the linen grave clothes, and the face cloth rolled up separately, and that was enough for him. Mary, on the other hand, although she was not a disciple, but was there close to Jesus, needed to hear the voice of Jesus. <clears throat> Once she heard his voice, then she recognized him. And the rest of the disciples needed to see Jesus. It wasn't until Jesus was standing in their midst in verse 19, greeting them, showing them his hands aside, that they were filled with joy. But unfortunately for Thomas, he wasn't there. Now, probably forever, Thomas has been called Doubting Thomas. It's kind of like a late-night TV host gave him an insulting name, and that name has stuck with him for 2,000 years. Names of other people you've probably heard before are Sleepy Joe or Lion Ted or Crooked Hillary. Things that get placed on people and are just stuck with people. Doubting Thomas was one of those names. But notice that Thomas is almost exactly like every other disciple. Mary had told them all that Jesus had rose from the dead, but they didn't really believe her. Maybe their hopes had raised a little bit, but, and maybe they were simply gathered together that day to talk about what she said. But if there was no joy until Jesus showed up, then there was no real belief. The bottom line is that the disciples didn't really believe Mary until they saw Jesus face to face. In the sense that we say that, Thomas was doubting Thomas. We could say that about all the disciples until they met Jesus face to face. Now in verse 25, Thomas won't believe the disciples until he's seen them. But that's okay because God has a plan. But if we look at Thomas in comparison to the other disciples, there's two things about him we do want to understand. First, although we might say he needed the same thing, we also recognize that the circle of influence had grown a bit, hadn't it? When when Mary told the disciples, it was just Mary saying she'd seen it. Seen him, kind of like me saying I'd seen a UFO. But now that they've seen Jesus and believed, when when Thomas is with them, he has now like 12 people who've seen Jesus alive. Still, though, he's unwilling to list their testimony. But Thomas is not hopeless. Thomas is open about his doubt and his skepticism. And what we've seen over and over in John, in the book of John, is that doubt and skepticism are not deal breakers. Jesus can work with people like this as long as they are open about where they're at and open to the possibility of new truth. In your own lives today, as you deal with people, as you walk with people, as you play with people and work with people, do you recognize a difference in spirit? There may be those who are completely shut down to the idea of Christ in their lives. But I would guess there's many more who are really open to the idea, except they're skeptical about it. They're open to the idea, but they want to know more about it. They they, they want to see it for themselves. God is okay with that. Why? Because God loves us. The second distinctive thing about Thomas is that he basically missed church one week. Now, I'm not harping on anybody for missing church, but think about it. All the disciples are together discussing whatever they're discussing, praying, whatever they're doing, except Thomas. 
Evidently, he had someplace more important to be. And sometimes when you don't show up, you miss seeing Jesus. Now, again, I, 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 don't, I don't know how to say this right. I'm not trying to get on people for missing church. But I'm worried about our society today. We all have those things that come up. Maybe sometimes it used to be for me. I, every once in a while, I'd have to work on a Sunday. It wasn't something I chose to do. I just had to. Or sometimes you go on vacation and it doesn't work out to, to get into a church when you're on vacation. But certainly if you're not in town, you can't come to church. But I think far too many people today are looking at church as something we do when we have extra time. Yet the Bible clearly tells us that when two or three are gathered in his name, that he is here. And I believe that means that he's at work, even more so than our singular lives. And what that means for me is that I want to be here because I want to see his hand at work. I want to come with the expectation that when we've gathered together, that God is going to work on my life and on your life and, and, and bring something miraculous together. Wouldn't it be great if every Sunday we showed up that someone got saved? Wouldn't it be great if every Sunday new people were coming and getting saved? And, and man, how could you be, not come every week if people are being saved every week? I shared earlier that this week has just, again, been one of those weeks where God has just kind of walked beside me each step of the way. And, 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 and I've been saying that to people. I can't wait to tell them what, what God has done for me. And I'm sure some people are skeptical about it. I'm sure that maybe they haven't had this type of experience. But when we walk beside God and we, we put those things in his hands, he is there because God is alive. And when we say that Jesus is risen and we respond, he's risen indeed, we're saying that he's still risen, that he's still at work, that God is still at work in our lives through the Holy Spirit. We're not on our own. And so we're open to the idea that, that God is there. But I think we also need to be open to the idea that we need to do our part in showing up. We need to do our part in inviting people to the party. We need to do our part to say, this is why I go to church. This is why I want you to go to church. Why I want you to be a part of it. Why you, you could experience. You know, I think there was a time growing up uh, back in the 70s and 80s where I just, for whatever reason, and I think it was just me, but kind of thought, well, you can only really get saved at church. And today we know that Someone could be walking down the street. We could be you know, at the baseball game or the hockey game, whatever game I'm at. And, and if someone wants to know about Jesus, I can lead them to God right there. Right? We know that wherever we're at. But there's this sense that people need to get into the house of God and worship together. They need to come in here and, and, and see what God is doing in the lives of his people because too many people out there don't know God and don't know what God's doing. And this is where we get lifted up. So Thomas wouldn't be doubting Thomas had he not missed church the week before. But what we also know is that we serve an awesome God who doesn't give up on us when we miss out. Because we read in verses 26 and 27, a week later his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your hand here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Praise God. God didn't give up. God didn't say, hey, you missed the boat last week. You're out. God said, here I am. You see, when Thomas said these things to the other disciples, Jesus heard him. He heard the skepticism and the doubt. He heard the stubborn refusal to believe the, apostles, I mean, the disciples' testimony. Unless Thomas sees the same thing they did, and Jesus responds with, here I am. What kind of Savior is Jesus? He's the kind of Savior who has a policy, no disciple left behind. I think that's the Marines, right, who talk about no Marine left behind. Our service branches, our, our, our brothers and sisters in arms often talk about no one left behind. That comes from Jesus who says, none of mine will be left behind. And Jesus is faithful. And he comes to us again and again. Jesus is not angry or frustrated with Thomas. Instead, he comes a second time to his disciple, and he gives them peace. And to Thomas, he gives what he needs to be complete, to have a complete and full faith. 
And how does Thomas respond? My Lord and my God. Let me ask you today. Do you remember making that statement at some point in your life? Maybe you didn't say it that way, but was there a point in your life when you received Jesus as Savior because in an instant you knew that God was God and that Jesus was the Christ and that he's risen from the dead and you were saved? Folks, this verse may be the entire, the highest point of the whole book of John. This is what Jesus wants from you, for you to come to a place where you can echo Thomas by surrendering and submitting and communing to Jesus. You see, when we say Jesus is Lord, we are not just stating the theological truth that Jesus is Lord overall. What we're doing is submitting to the lordship of Jesus. Lord means master. It's the word Paul uses to describe slave owners in Ephesians 6. So when we say Jesus is my Lord, I am willingly, deliberately making myself a slave of Jesus. I bend my knee before his throne and that knee is something that stays bent the rest of my life. You see, when Thomas says, my Lord, my God, he finally gets it right. And he makes a marvelous profession of faith. He sees Jesus for who he fully is. But just as important, he submits himself to Jesus for who Jesus really is. Jesus is his Lord and his God. Again, the perfect high point of the book. Now, we didn't read him as part of our text, but it goes on in verses 29 to 31 to say, Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Jesus performed many signs, many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but they're written, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. In these last couple of verses, John sets aside his story for a minute to explain why he wrote this book. He wrote this for you to help all people reach a final decision for Jesus. You see, when we talk about belief in Jesus or faith, we tend to think in terms of black and white. Either you believe in Jesus or you don't. Either you're a disciple of Jesus or you're not. Either you're in or you're out. But can I suggest to you today that maybe there is another category that we need to think about? There's those people who haven't yet received Jesus, so they're technically out, but who are close who are maybe skeptical or or waiting or simply need to meet with Jesus, need that divine moment in their lives. You know, the truth is sometimes, in fact, Pastor Campbell said it this morning in Sunday school, is that Jesus doesn't have any grandchildren. We don't get to heaven by becoming, because our parents have faith. We don't get to heaven because someone else we know has faith. We get to heaven, we become a son or daughter of the the most high when we have our own faith. And it's possible even in the church today that there's, and maybe not our church, but in some churches that there's people who believe because of someone else's faith. And we need to come to a point where we have our own faith. Where each person says, I've met with God, I've seen his hands, I put my hand in his side, and I believe that Jesus is risen. Now, when I say that I'm speaking more figuratively than anything else, most of us are not going to have Jesus stand in the middle, show up and appear in the middle of a locked room and say, hey, touch my hands and here, put your hand on my side. But I believe that because God is alive, that there is a moment for each one of us, that his presence is made known to us in some way, and we have to either recognize at that moment that this is God or miss out on that moment. Now, the good news is if we missed out on that moment, God doesn't give up on us, and and we'll get that moment again. But don't miss out on too many. It may become too late. I say all this to say today that I know that most, if not all of us in this room, are saved and sanctified, that we've known the Lord enough, that we've had that moment with him, and we've, we've given our lives over to him. That doesn't mean we're perfect. I get it. We're all on a path. We're all on a journey. Um... Yes, we believe we don't have to sin, but that doesn't mean that our journeys are the same. We're working towards becoming better Christians. But I do know that in each of your lives, including my life, there are people who have not yet had that moment. There are people out there who who may give their heart to Jesus today if they simply have that moment where they meet with the divine God. 
And can I say what better place to meet with God than in the church? Can I say that maybe the reason we're inviting people to join us in church is not just because we want to have more people and want to hang out with more people or, or be able to report to the district we have more people, but it's because we believe that a church might be the easiest place for them to have a divine or a moment with the divine God. I believe in the church that hearts are most open to looking for God, to, 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 to having God reach out. Our Sunday school this morning, lesson this morning came from Acts 16 and, and the earthquake and the prison that Paul and Silas were in and, and that great moment and opened people's eyes. But could it be on a regular basis God simply uses his house to tell people about himself? So we bring people in because we want to enjoy fellowship with them, but we bring them in also because we want them to have the greatest opportunity to have, meet with a holy God. We live in a culture today that wants us to believe that there is no God. We live in a culture where it wants us to believe that, that most people are against God, that as Christians we are a minority of people. We live in a culture that wants us to despise or at least be disappointed in our faith, that wants us to be dejected by our faith. But can I tell you today that God is alive? Can I tell you today there are places around the world where people are coming to know God as their, uh, Jesus as their Lord and Savior faster than we can count? There are places today where people are longing to get to Jesus. And I believe in America today that there is an underlying heart of people who still want to know Jesus. Who are ready for that moment who if given the choice today would say, I choose Jesus. And they're simply saying today, I just got to see for myself. I didn't read ahead for our Sunday school lesson today. I didn't know we were talking about Acts and Paul and Silas in prison and, and all that came from that. But it seemed to fit perfectly with where God has led my heart this week in this idea that our role is simply to live out God in our lives. I am never going to save anybody. God does the saving. But what I can do is surrender my heart to the Lord, allow him to work through my life, and be there once they have that moment to help them on the process. That's our role as Christians. Well, pastor, you've been trained for this. It's easier for you. It's not. It's something we do. And maybe words sometimes come easier. I, I was joking the other night, and uh, someone introduced me at, at, at uh, I think, like our PTA media as, as Pastor Aaron. You know, I'm like, I am a pastor, but really, you know, the, the term Aaron means, you know, ye with big mouth. I can talk a lot. And someone said, hey, I don't really like, you know, leading these meetings. I'm not very, you know, eloquent type of thing. I don't like to say a lot. And I said, hey, I'm a pastor. I can talk for an hour and not say anything. And, of course, all joking aside with that is the fact that when it comes to leading people, it's not about the eloquence of our voice or how much we can talk. It's about our heart and are we leaving our heart in, in front of other people. Maybe for me, I can, God can use me to say the right words. Maybe for you, it's whatever you're good at. Maybe you're part of a cooking class or a sewing class or, or maybe at work you're doing something at work or, or, or maybe you play baseball at, at baseball game or, or whatever the case could be. But there's people that you're around that God can use your life to show them and have that divine moment and then use you afterwards to help them, to disciple them as someone once discipled you. Again, I believe the reality today in America is that most people aren't out there going against God, but rather out there saying, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. Or maybe the words they're using today, if God is real, let me see it for myself. And so I would ask us as Christians, do we believe that God is real? And I know that our answer is yes. 
But do we believe it enough that we would be willing to say to God, Lord, in this situation, make yourself known to my brother or sister and pray with them and trust that God will do it. Now, logically, God will do it, right? He wants them to be saved. We want them to be saved. <clears throat> they are open to being saved. If we pray that prayer, we can trust that God's going to answer it. But we have to be open that people need to have that moment with Jesus and be open that God has a perfect timing for it. The good news is, just as Jesus did for Thomas, Jesus will do for those who ask. We may not see his presence, but God will make himself known to us if we too ask. So, let me just ask you this morning, have you seen Jesus for yourself? Have you had that divine moment for you when you said, here I am, my Lord and my God? If you have, then have you opened yourself to praying that for others? One of the things I was praying for today, lots of times I, I pray for my son and, you know, he has lots of issues um, and I pray that he gets his life together and starts making better decisions and, and, and gets some help and, and those type of things. And, and this morning, my prayer for him is that he would just have a divine moment. If he can get that divine moment, God can work out the rest. And I think that's true for every person in our lives, that even though we want to pray, and, and, and today if, if in Sunday school I shared that, you know, we're praising God because Becca made it home safely today and... Um, Barb shared that her daughter Janice is going to be traveling, and we certainly want to pray for those things. But, but let's start with the prayer that says, may today be the day that they see Jesus, that they see Jesus for themselves, that, God, you'll work all the rest of the stuff out, that it's all good, that we trust God, and we'll, we'll pray the other things as well. But today, we want people to see Jesus. We want their lives forever changed because they have that meeting with the divine God that they walk away from and they, and they know. And we all know it happens. They know that they know that they know that they met with God. They may not choose to receive him at that moment, but they have that moment. So today, let's pray for others and pray that they have that moment. And if you haven't had that moment yet for yourself today, if you're living off of somebody else's faith or, or just not even sure, then I'm praying for you today as we pray that you'll have that divine moment as well and receive Jesus as your Lord today. In just a moment, I'm going to pray with us, and then we're going to sing our song in closing. But be thinking about those that, that really need to see Jesus as we pray. Father God, thank you for this day and for the opportunity to gather together. Thank you, O Lord, for the life of Thomas and, 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 and for the real, realization that that he needed a little more. He needed to have a meeting with you. And Father, you were faithful to provide. Father, today we are still in need of that divine moment. That time when you come and meet with us one-on-one. -on -one. And so Lord, if there's even one here today who would say I've never had that divine moment, may today be the moment. May you show yourself to them right now in such a way that they can't leave this place without having to make a decision. Father, you are God, and you are faithful, and we believe in those divine moments. And Father, for those of us that have had that divine moment, may we leave this place today encouraged and wanting for other people to have that divine moment. I pray for my son, and I pray for other sons and daughters and here, and others, friends and workers and co-workers and relatives, and all these that have never had their moment, that this would be the time, that this would be the day or the week that they too would have a moment where they come face to face with the Almighty God. Not for our glory, Lord, but for your glory, for the benefit of your kingdom, that we might call them brothers and sisters in the Lord. And Lord, for all these things, we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. Let's stand together, shall we, as we sing, God leads us along in shady green pastures so rich and so sweet. <clears throat> Yeah. 
In shady green pastures so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Where the water's cool flow bathes the weary one's feet, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. The last, away from mire and away from the clay, God leads the dear children along. Away up in glory, eternity's day, God leads the dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season all the day long. Father God, as we now close this service in prayer, we give you great praise for being faithful. We thank you for the lives you touch here today, for the lives you touch at home, and the lives you'll touch this week. And Father, now lead us along this week that we might see people as you see them, that we might reach out and love them as you love them, that we might be used of you to lead them along in their, in their journey as well. Father, may it be this week that we have opportunity to share your great love and gather together next week and, and share those stories as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.